only five past. Five. So what I might do is hand over to Erica for a minute and we'll, we'll say a few words. Joining us this evening, uh, just before we kick Sorry? off, I'd just I don't like to take a moment to remember Jimmy. Um, he was an honorary member of both Rockery Yacht Club and the Shannon One Design Association, a fine boat builder, sailor and lifelong friend of the class. I know his legacy will live on in the beloved boats he built and the memories he has provided to so many. And in time, Jimmy's life will be celebrated by many people in different ways. But before we proceed, I'd just like to ask everyone here to maintain a moment's silence in memory of Jimmy. May he rest in peace. Um, there will be an opportunity for people to share stories at the end if anybody wishes. But for now, I'd like to hand you over to Vincent Delaney, who's going to tell us all about Lord Crofton and the Gailey Bay regattas on Loch Reed. So thank you, Vincent. Thank you very much, Erica. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for allowing me to make this presentation. I hope we can all go sailing soon, but what I'll just tell you a true the running of annual regattas. This was not always the case. Today, the Yacht Club is everything. Where the boats are stored, where friends can be found, where launching facilities exist. The Yacht Club is where you'll find the bar, the change rooms, the car parks. Hello? Can you hear me all right? Yeah, so the Yacht Club is where all the facilities exist. So it wasn't always that way. Even I remember house regattas at Waterloo Lodge, at Somerset, on Elfeet Bay, at Gertelucca. At these regattas, the host bought a barrel of beer, called on friends to lay marks, and called on another friend to man the rescue boats. If I recall collect correctly, most of the competitors slept in the house and we won't discuss that now. But quite honestly, I don't remember how the meals were organized. But such regattas were very close to the pattern of 19th century Shannon regattas, such as that in Gailey Bay. The precedents for Gailey Bay regattas were regattas at Loch Allen, Loch Key, Athlone, and Loch Derg. Incidentally, Killinure didn't have regatta, annual regattas as we know them. So here, there's an image of Loch, Isle, Loch Allen Island, where Michael O'Connor had a boathouse and he had a, a shooting lodge as well. On Loch Allen, the regattas were held just after the Great Famine from 1851 until 1870. And they generally consist of one day's racing for four or more large yachts. Michael O'Connor was the host on Loch Allen Island. And in the evening time, a ball was held at John Burchell's house, Black Rock, which is near Drumshanbo. And at Black Rock, they held all night dancing. Now, if you look at the picture carefully, you can actually see the starting gun sitting on the foreshore, ready to be fired. 
But incidentally, there never was a yacht club as such at Loch Allen. Likewise at Loch Key, the Honorable Robert King, second Viscount Lorton, acted as host at Rockingham, where he entertained dozens of guests in his big house. And there you can see the big house up on the hill. It was the one day of the year when the domain was opened up to the tenants of the, uh, of the Lorton estate. The gentry were entertained by a military band playing on the lawn in front of the house. And then the band moved down to nearby Castle Island, where they played more music to entertain the gathered crowds. About eight shots compete in those regattas. Viscount Lorton bought a 60 sovereign silver cup. Today, the value would be about 3,500 euro. Viscount Lorton also bought the best yacht that money could buy. He paid the best naval officer to steer it, and he presented the cup to himself. <laughs> After the yachting and the presentations, there was a dejeuner, followed by dancing till dawn in the house at Rockingham. And these regattas took place from 1858 to 62. A Gailey Bay regatta started 10 years later in 1872, perhaps to fill the void which existed following the demise of the other regattas further upstream. So where did Gailey Bay regattas take place? So next slide, please. Uh, Gailey Castle is a 14th century tower house marking the edge of the Umonia lands of the O'Kelly clan in Roscommon. It's located on the water's edge on the Roscommon shore of Loch Ree. And if you look at the map there on the left, you can see Gailey Bay marked in red and Loch Rockery village, which is the nearest village also marked in red and Roscommon town. So uh, a lot of the people involved would have come from Loch Rockery or from Roscommon town. Now, if you look on, on the right and look at the castle, at the bottom right hand side, you can actually see the regatta yachts anchored in the bay, or some, some of the fleet anchored in the bay. And in the castle, there are two brave regatta competitors who are sitting up there enjoying the afternoon scenery. Adjoining the castle stood a boathouse, and that boathouse belonged to Lord Crofton of Moat Park. And the boathouse would have housed a steamer, which he used to visit the other houses around the lake. Uh, it was eight kilometers from Moat Park to Gailey Bay. Unfortunately, the house at Moat accidentally burnt down in 1865, but was rebuilt quickly by Lord Crofton over the following two years. So the key question is who organized the regattas at Gailey Bay? Following the death of Edward II Baron Crofton in 1869, his son and heir was the 35 year old Edward Henry Churchill, third Baron Crofton. So we should have a slide there of Edward Henry Churchill. Uh, there he, on the left, that's him as a young man looking rather like a corner boy. And on the right, him as an old man in the House of Lords dressed in his ceremonial regalia. So when the young Edward took over the Crofton estates on the death of his father, it was said that he did not inherit any wealth. The family wealth had been squandered. Entertaining the South Roscommon voters in a strategy to win elections to the House of Commons in Westminster, and family resources had been further stretched, rebuilding the great house after the fire, running up large debts. According to the family, he inherited a generous and unselfish nature and a longing to help and give to others, which he can only indulge in at the expense of his own personal comfort and necessity. Well, they would say that, wouldn't they? This was a desire to, was it this desire to help and give to others with the incentive to actually hold the regattas? Perhaps so. So back to the regattas. The first regatta was held in 1872 
We don't have much information about that regatta, so we'll jump forward to 1874, when Hunt's Yachting Magazine reports on the regatta and on the eight yachts which were competing. The competitors were divided into two classes, yachts up to 30 tonnes and those under five tonnes. So we should have an image there. Yes, so this is an image from the National Library showing the beach in Drummanier with an abandoned large cutter from the 1870s. It could be the Virago. In those days, yachts were described as being plank on edge. In other words, they were very narrow and very deep down into the water. They had a very vertical stem and they would have had carried a very long bowsprit in order to increase the amount of sail area carried. Yachts at that time were still manned predominantly by paid hands. At the 1874 regatta, the large yachts consisted of Lord Crofton's 13-ton wanderer. As a regatta host, he had to have a large yacht, didn't he? Uh, William Potts of Ballinasloe was in the 13-ton Audax, with which we're familiar with the photographs of her in Lockery Yacht Club. Viscount Avonmore from Belle Isle in Portumna was racing in the 10-ton Virago. And we think that this could be the Virago that we're looking at on the screen. And finally, there was Henry Jackson's eight-ton Haiti. And I believe Henry Jackson came from Goethe Lucker House on Loch Derg. Of the smaller boats, Captain Burke from the Abbey Roscommon, which is now the Abbey Hotel, entered the cutter Eno. A cutter meant that she had two jigs, a mainsail and a topsail. Also entered was J.L. Payton of Dryney County Leitrim in the Bella, a sloop, so that is with one mast and one jib. William Noble Holton of Monksland Athlone had the secret, she was a cutter. And finally, J. Piercy's schooner was called the Nora, and that means that she had two masts. So we should have a slide here of the smaller yachts. Smaller yachts have the same features as the larger ones with deep hulls, narrow beam, large sail area. Boat speed was gauged by their displacement in tons and two minutes per ton per hour was the handicap that was allowed. I think we can learn something about the regatta when we look at the race course. They raced the usual course twice around or 22 miles. Can we have the slide on that? That's right, yeah. This course took the yachts to Priest's Island and Wood Point Boy. Such courses with long legs and few turning marks put the emphasis on boat speed and sail handling in the changing conditions, while tactics were considered to be of less importance. In 1874, the conditions were windy. At the start of the race for Lord Crofton's Handsome Cup, the wind was from astern. Wanderer was on full sail. Virago opted to go with one reef down. Audax had one reef down and a jib header. And the smallest yacht, Haiti, was on full mainsail, balloon jib and balloon foresail. Spinnakers as we know them had not been invented yet at that time. After seven miles racing to Priest's Island Boy, Audax was leading from Virago and Haiti. It was a five mile beach home. Haiti, the smallest boat of them all, put in a reef and climbed windward of all the others to reach the flag boat at the end of the first round in first place, with Wanderer in second place. Immediately Audax and Virago both gave up, realizing that they had no chance of winning the cup. For the second le leg, they had to go round the course in the, in the opposite direction. Haiti shook out her reef and hoisted the balloon jib again. So in order to stick with her, Wanderer, and Wanderer had a similar rig to Audax that we're looking at on the screen. Uh, Wanderer decided to hoist her mainsail. But 
under the, in the breeze that they had at the time, it was quite unmanageable, so they had to take it back down again. It was a seven mile leg to Wood Point Boy, and Haiti held a good lead. And on the beat home, Haiti finished three minutes ahead of her larger opponent to win the cup without having to apply any handicap. Then we took, go to the race for the smaller yachts. They gallantly sailed the same 11 mile course as the large yachts, but only once around. It was still very windy. As she rounded the Wood Point Boy, Mr. Houghton's yacht secret filled and sank. Fortunately, Bella saw what happened and quickly recovered the secret's crew of Mr. Holton of Monksland at Sloan, Mr. Spruill of Rahara House, and Mr. Gunning from St. John's. Captain Burke in Eno won that particular race, but he refused to accept the prize, so the race was rerun on the following day. After the race, Lunch was sent down from the kitchen of Moat Park and the sailors dined on the flagship. I hope this gives some sense of what the regatta scene was like. You might think that there were very few boats competing, but Harmon told us of only six Shannons racing at Hudson Bay regattas in the 1950s. Nobody went back to Moat Park for a party in the evening other than Lord Castlemaine and Lord Avonmore, who stayed there overnight. Everybody else stayed on yachts and houseboats anchored offshore. We have a report of the one-day regatta from 1889. We had a fishing lodge at Hazel Lodge, Hazel Point on Loch Derg and was Commodore of Lockbury Dot Club. Other committee members were Edmund Bailey, Thomas Austin Patrick Mapeter, known as Master Tom, M.S. Bailey, William J. Talbot from Mount Talbot, Joseph Burke, John Kelly, and Robert D. Leving of Carna County Roscommon, and John Nealon. They were all County Roscommon magistrates and all knew each other very well from working on the Roscommon Grand Jury. The regatta, the regatta secretary was George James and the treasurer, William E. Holmes, who incidentally was the agent for Lord Crofton. But one of the significant things about these regattas was, was a very consistent management team over 25 years or so. So uh, we're talking about 1889, the first race was a sailing race for 18-foot centreboard boats with a sprit sail for a one-pound cash prize. Now, this sprit that's on the screen, I'm sorry, the, the, the picture isn't very sharp. And that particular boat has oars and an outboard engine. But of course, if they were racing, uh, they would just have had the sprit sail. The, among the competitors was Pat Ward, boat builder from the Strand Athlone. Ned Norton, his neighbor and a rival boat builder. Both were showing off their latest models in the hopes of selling more 18 foot lake boats. The other competitor was Traherne Holmes from St. David's in Tromineer. In the race for the Lockery Challenge Cup, Captain Smithick in the Countess and Mr. Waller's Layla and Mr. Holmes Violet were competing along with Mr. Smith's Audax. The following day was described as the People's Day with a number of rowing races. The day was concluded with a punt chase. And at, in the punt chase, a man in a punt headed off up the lake to hide in the reeds and chasers followed 10 minutes later to find and capture the man in his boat. And whoever captured the man got a, a cash prize. By the 1880s, the land war was in full flight. The regatta committee remained consistent under Lord Crofton. Some of the newspaper reports in the mid 80s described some of the rowing contests being very close and exciting. In other words, they're saying the yachting races 
were neither close nor exciting. An interesting feature of these regattas was that the band played on the deck of one of the houseboats moored offshore. In 1891, the regatta, sorry, the Roscommon newspapers were full of letters of resignation from the regatta committee, letters from the public complaining that they'd been let down by the regatta committee. The reason for the uproar was the regatta program had been printed before the regatta committee had had a chance to see it. And the regatta had been extended to three days without allowing a day for rowing races by the general public. Was the program subsequently amended? No, it wasn't. So in 1891, there were no rowing races at the regatta. The yacht had a huge sail area, such as the Ajax, were now gone to be replaced by Yachts described as raters. There were also Collines, which was a one design class from Kingstown to Leary. And also there were half deckers. These boats were generally sailed by their owners and not by the paid boatmen as before. In 1895, the Roscommon Messenger reported the regatta came off on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week. The attendance of the general public seemed to be on the decrease every year. In 1903, a group of gentlemen from the Water Wag Club in Kingstown invited themselves to attend the Gailey Bay Regatta. They bought their boats down by train, and this was the first time one design sailing had been seen at Gailey Bay. In these races, all the boats finished in close proximity, something which had only been seen before in the rowing races. In the 1906 regatta, which spanned over two days, Charles Dignam was once again the efficient, the efficient honorable secretary for the event. Only two yachts con contested the Lockery Challenge Cup for the raters. Uh, we had, of, of the two competitors, we had Miss Violet Augusta McGann in the Callista. So that looked like a very big boat for a lady to be in charge of, so well done her. And likewise, also we had Mr. George Parson racing in The Witch, and we're probably familiar with the picture of The Witch that's in the Lockery Yacht Club at the moment. In the race for centerboard boats, uh, they, allowed, they allowed fishing boats up to 19 feet to compete, and they penalized any that were over 18 feet. They were allowed a sail area of not to exceed 100 square feet, and three boats competed. Now, it was the same competitors in the 18-footers. So we had Miss Violent Augusta McGann, Mr. George Parsons, and Mr. Leving. First prize was two pounds and a half crown entry fee. Six water wags competed for the three pound prize. In the race for half-deckers, mermaids, and colleens, two boats took place, including Lord Kingston's Mila from Kilronan Castle in North Roscommon, and Mr. Mr. McGann in Violet. One aspect of the 1906 regatta was that Lady Crofton gave a leg of lamb to the first person to walk the slippery pole, which was a, a thing that gave a lot of entertainment to the people. And one of the water wags which was competing in 1906 was a Mr. Joshua Hargraves in a water wag called Pansy. And here I have to admit that this is the boat that I now own. So she is probably the only survivor of the Gailey Bay regattas that are still racing. In the regatta scene was described by William Bullfin in his 1907 book, Rambles in Erin. Now he described the regatta as follows. The regatta has been organized by a few local personages of note and the people had been offered the privilege of subscribing for prizes and expenses. 
a privilege which they did not appear to have been highly appreciated. I was unable to ascertain for what precise object the event was intended. It was not for the amusement of the classes, for none of the gentry took part in the competition, as far as I could observe. It was not for the amusement of the masses, they took but scant interest in the proceedings, and nobody seemed to encourage them or to invite them to do so. No gate money was taken. There was no charge for admission at all. There were no reserved seats. You came and went as you pleased. But it was highly respectable. The committee men wore red badges. There was a patron, some lord or marquis, or I'm not sure whether he was alive or dead, present or absent. His name was written in the program, but I forget it. The organizing and managing committees were all busy doing nothing in particular. There was a marquee in which they held consultations and in which they, they refreshed themselves with whiskey, <laughs> obtained for that special purpose by the public subscription. There was a flagstaff planted on a hillock from which floated a Union Jack. Another Union Jack floated from a pole of the marquee. There were four or five yachts in the river and each had a Union Jack. Two wheezing steam launches also floated Union Jacks. A sailing boat of nondescript to category was decorated in a similar manner. There, there were no other flags except a blue and white signal pennant, which was lowered or hoisted as occasion demanded. There were about a dozen tents for the sale of sugar stick, gingerbread and gooseberries. And there were two or three tents for the sale of drink. Five policemen were on duty. They were, we're told, about 300 people present, including adults and children, classes and masses, committee men and spectators, attendants and competitors. I observed several committee men leaving the marquee in a body. Their leader carried a double barrel shotgun across his arm. He had a pencil behind his ear and a sheaf of papers protruding from his breast pocket. He marched with a firm tread to where the blue signal flag was flying, hauled it down, fired a shot, after which he and his comrades retired for refreshment. the shot. If you inspect this picture here carefully, you can see all the crowds on the shore. The whole shore is lined with, with people watching the racing. At the regattas, there was a lot of excitement as the competitors maneuvered in the vicinity of the starting line. But once they started, they disappeared over the horizon and the officials and spectators had nothing to do but to return to the drinking tents. In 1911, the Westmead Independent reported as follows. Gailey Bay's successful revival of a noted fixture. Four or five years ago, Gailey Bay regattas enjoyed a fame that was something more than local, but unfortunately was allowed to lapse and doubtless would have remained so were it not for the assiduous efforts of Mr. C.C. Dignan who was mainly instrumental in reviving the fixture this year. The revival was attended with every success and Mr. Dignam and those who helped him in his task have been more than compensated for their efforts for the entries for the various classes on Thursday and Friday were quite up to the standard of the regatta even when it was in its heyday. Mr. Bob T Payne entertained the visitors with his characteristic hospitality. Incidentally, Bob, Bob Payne, he lived at Gailey Bay House, which adjoined the castle and the boathouse. Edward Henry Churchill Crofton, third Baron Crofton, had never married. And he died in September 1912. He didn't have any sons to carry the family name. So his nephew, Arthur Edward Crofton, 
became the fourth Baron Crofton. Unfortunately for the regatta, he was more interested in horses than he was in regattas and yachts. So what happened to the regattas? Could the regattas survive without the support of Lord Crofton? Could they compete with the other regattas on the lake? From about 1913, the Roscommon Journal reported that a rival regatta was organized at Port Run, which was described as being a democratic regatta. It was a rowing regatta only. The level of skill involved in organizing, organizing that regatta left much to be desired. There was excessive drinking and drunkenness, which on occasion had resulted in a fatal stabbing. And it would appear that the activities afloat at Port Run were secondary to the drinking and to the revelry ashore. That's not to say that there was no drinking at Gailey Bay regattas. Next picture. Here we have a number of regatta competitors at their tent. And look at the size of the whiskey jars that they have there with them. The Gailey Bay regattas survived until 1914. And thereafter, the Great War sent the military men to France many of whom did not return or returned injured. This was really effectively the end of the Gailey Bay regattas. In conclusion, Gailey Bay was a smaller regatta than the Athlone regatta. It was part of the lake. It was on part of the lake where there are many islands and rock outcrops, some of which are unmarked. Any regatta re required enthusiastic local-based organizers and willing contestants. Perhaps it was the lack of yachts based at Gailey Bay that it was a limiter on the number of contestants. And if you didn't have access to a houseboat, you couldn't compete at the regatta. However, the regatta did survive for over 40 years, so they must have been doing something right to attract competitors to come back year after year. So thank you all very much. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Does anybody have any comments or questions or suggestions for revival of the Gailey Bay regattas? Uh, just add a little uh, note here. Um, Vincent, when we lived in Delgany oh, up to about 10 years ago, 20. <laughs> 20 years ago, I beg your pardon. Uh, there was a Mr. Roach who owned a chemist you know me? in uh, Black Lion, which is between Greystones and Delgany. I'm sure he's still there. He's but dead. His, hmm? He must be dead. Right well, just he said he must be dead, but that we don't know. But Naomi? Yeah. Uh, Philip, hang on. There's <laughs> Philip. Hi, Philip. Are we all muted? <laughs> no, we're not. No. Oh, sorry. Are we muted? No, we are. Oh, we can. We can hear you all right. Oh, you can hear me. Anyway, Mr. Roach said that his father had been a member of the Gailey Bay Regatta uh, events for many years, and that he had a whole lot of programs. Naomi, upstairs in his attic. Oh my goodness! We should be. We should try and get those. Yeah. Can you I, hear me? Yeah. I'll make some calls and see if I can. Well, the chemist's still there. His fa family might have them. It was worth, it's worth inquiring, certainly. Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't remember seeing the name Roach, so it might, it, it might have been sort of from his wife's family or something like that. It could well have been, yes. Naomi, can you unmute people? Um, yes, I have. Well, people can unmute themselves um, if they wish. But Alan was just speaking there, Alan Reinhardt. So I think I've finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will endeavour to unmute as many people. Um, any other questions around Gailey Bay or Philip? I think you have a question. <laughs> no, I'm not. Philip, we can't hear you. Vincent. Ah. Yes, Philip. Can anybody? Yeah. 
Anybody hear anybody? We can, yeah. We can hear you, Philip. Can we? Yes. Yeah. I'm not sure Philip can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he can. Can you He's unmute people? Naomi? Oh, yeah. Vincent, can you talk to Naomi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, we, we can hear you all right. It's just that you don't have your sound on, I think. Do you have a loudspeaker turned on? <laughs> how, how, would, how would he hear that if he didn't have it on? <laughs> it looks yeah. having technical issues. I'll text him. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Teddy Knight's Callista. You know, he's, he has a, his, his, his uh, house is called Callista. Yes. And, and in it, he has, a, he has a, 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 half, a half boat or something. Would that be the Callista that he's got as a... As, could as, well be, as, could well be, yes, yeah. yes. He has, he has a, his, his, the, the tabletop of his, of his kitchen is, a, is an old boat, and he has a few beams and stuff. For, I said it probably was from the Callisto, I suppose. Indeed, yes, yes. Is that true? I don't know, is there any, is there any nights there on, on, on listening in? I can't hear a thing. Teddy has been in hospital, so I can hear you. That yeah. <laughs> well, why can't I hear anything? Oh, the Callisto bowel. I don't know, because... We're I exactly, the Callisto bowel. There, yeah. And we could all hear him. Okay. And then you were waving at me. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, well, I'll, I'll shut up then. Vincent, I have a question for you. Vincent, oh um, yes. what, has been, what was the navigation like at the time? Was there, um, you talked about many households in the lake on shoals, yeah. and shoals, and but were the competitors able to uh, use navigation boys? I, I, I believe that the I'll, I'll navigation this. boys Otherwise, had been put down to facilitate the steamers. Bye. 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 That the steamers were operating at that stage up and down the lake and that they had demanded that the, uh, the navigation boys could be put in place. Yes, so there would have been navigation boys at that time. Thank you. I think that, that there was actually the steamer route used to come on, yes, on the conic side up the lake, inside, inside the island, as opposed to now where it goes outside the island. There is a way through there, and they were trying to restore it, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, there was, in the, in the Bullfin book, um, written about the regatta. Uh, there's a, there's yeah. a, uh, a, a I wonderful um, uh, thing about um, some lord or lady who comes down in there, effectively clapped out carriage, you know, and the Bullfins were Republicans and they, they had a very... Uh, very Republican, uh, yes. Uh, very they, did, they didn't like all those... They didn't like all those flags that were flying. No, they, they, they were really disparaging an awful about the clapped out carriage that came down with this clapped out lord who was about to join <laughs> the beast up in the local graveyard. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. But there was another oh, school about Bailey Bay. We had another regatta there. Uh, 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 I can't remember what it was. Probably barges and sod. And I do remember the Reinhardt's arriving um, in the steamship, their modern steamship. And uh, running out of steam and having to borrow burnt out nappies or not burnt out nappies or various things so everybody can get home again. Anyway, sorry, that's not a good <laughs> and, and that evening, Andy Wilson and I had to head down the lake as it was getting dark to find you and tow you the rest of the way home. That's quite right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other comments or questions regarding uh, Vincent's presentation? Vincent, uh, was there any relationship between the Leving who was on the committee to Walter Leving? That's Walter's father. Oh, right. Okay. And, and they, 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 they were living on the Roscommon side at that time. Ah. Uh, and they, they, only, they only bought Craig Duff later on. And what was his activity? Was he one of the landlord's organizers? Well, he, he, he was a farmer. Yeah. And, and uh, he was also on the grand jury. All oh, right. right. 
Can, can you amplify the grand jury? <laughs> well, uh, it, it was a form of court uh, that, that every county had their own grand jury for hearing cases. Uh, and they, they could, you know, the police could sort of highlight cases to the grand jury and then the grand jury would pursue the case. That's similar to what goes on in America today. Very similar, <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Vincent, you had a fantastic picture of Gailey Bay with a lot of uh, boats moored in the background. Do you know the name of any of them? Uh, that, the, the, the one picture which had a tent in the foreground and lots of boats in the background wasn't actually Gailey Bay. It was, in fact, the North Shannon. But I used that picture to sort of give the atmosphere. Fine. OK. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> 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 Vincent, you mentioned a, a lord, Aviemore. Vincent, you mentioned. Vincent, you you mentioned a lord, Aviemore, uh, was at the uh, regattas. Is was it Aviemore? Is the correct name, or uh, do you know anything about him? Uh, he ju just south of Portumna. There's a, a big house up on the hill there, and that's where the Lochder regattas were held for many years in the days when Loch Derg regattas were held in three different venues when they had one venue in the north end of the lake, one venue in the middle of the lake and one venue at the south of the lake. So Lord Avonmore's house was Bell Isle which is at the top end, just, just, just above the, the, the narrows at the top of Loch Derg. And Bertie Waller lived there for a while. That's correct, yes. Hence the Belle Isle Plate. Yeah. Hence yeah. the Belle Isle Plate, exactly. <laughs> Which had something to do with the Laney's as well. <laughs> They're always winning it. <laughs> Trying to win it. Was he... Actually, talking was he... about the regattas, my father used to tell me that they, basically the regattas at about the same time, the late 19th century, the, uh, the, the, the sort of grand houses, the Castle Locks, the Davids, the, the Traherne homes, they would they would have it rather like a sort of fox hunting meet. They everybody would meet and then they'd say, Right, should we go to you know, Gary Kennedy or we'll go to Terry Glass and uh, have a race? And it was quite sort of from what I understand, and they all had quite smart yachts. I think my great grandfather, uh, Robert Bob Waller, uh, who might have been the wallet you mentioned in the thing, was he he, he I know he had a boat. <laughs> cool. Well, either, I don't think there were. It's interesting you say there were three three locations, but my I, I sort of understood that they 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 had the regatta originally in the nineteenth century when uh, where they where they where they could have a, a sort of party and a house party and and um, something like that. Well, I believe John Lefroy is writing a history at the moment of Lockyard Yacht Club. So that'll all come out in the wash. <laughs> that right, John? Vincent? Yeah. Did, um, I, in my memory, there's a photograph of a steamer outside or up on the slip on the, beside that house on Loch Allen. And from memory, I think that steamer used to go right down to the Mediterranean and back. I don't know whether that's correct or not. Yeah, no, I, I've, seen, I've seen photographs of the steamer, certainly, yes. Uh, incidentally, the, the, the house in Lock Island, Lock Allen Island, was it was really a cottage. It was no more than a cottage. So, in fact, the boathouse was almost bigger than than the house itself. Thank you. Okay. Any final comments or questions for Vincent? Just, just I'd like to say that if anybody's ever cruising in there and, and doesn't go aground in in um, in Gailey Bay. Um, on the southern shore, you can actually still see the footprint of the boathouse. So it's worth if you're if you're there, it's something to go looking for. The whole footprint. And if you if you look if you look into the dock, you can see all the bricks, but where the bricks that <coughs> it was built out of. Hmm. Vincent, I believe there was a dry dock there as well. Um, what you see there today looks like a dry dock. But in fact, that's actually the boathouse. 
Okay. Uh, I've, I haven't been in there. I hope to get up there later this year. No, it, 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 it looks exactly like a, a dry dock without any gates on it, is what's there at the moment. Okay, okay. If there are no more questions, we, the governing body, thought that we might just open this up now. And thank you very much, Vincent to anybody who might have some stories about Jimmy uh, and Jimmy's gone again <laughs> or may have to celebrate his life I know we we discussed some of those to begin with but perhaps if I could just open it up by saying that I well we first met Jimmy in the well a rather long time ago in the late 60s early 70s when uh, there was a Graham Goodwin who bought one of the houses in Bali Harbour and he had asked Jimmy whether he would build him a rowing boat. Uh, we convinced Graham, uh, some of you may re remember Graham Goodwin, he had a shock of white hair and he was known colloquially as Powder Puff. Um, <laughs> we persuaded Graham that he might not buy a rowing boat but he might buy a Shannon One design which rode just as well as a rowing boat or a fishing boat. And he might uh, ask me to build a Michana One design rather than a rowing boat. It took a little bit of time to persuade Graham. But anyway, we headed off to Roscommon uh, where we met this gentleman at the end of a field. And Graham said, well, actually, I don't want a rowing boat. I'd like a Shana One design. And of course, Jimmy wasn't too familiar with these boats. Uh, and it was quite difficult to persuade Jimmy to even consider building a Shana One design. And the way Jimmy does things is he never gives you an answer. He just sort of went quiet and <laughs> we thought that was the end of it. But Jimmy headed off to see Walter Leving uh, down in the Inner Lakes. And then he apparently rang my father and he arranged then to go over to Derry Dara to have a look at the AC3. And um, then uh, a little bit later, the 107 arrived. And as we know with Jimmy, there are two things that he just hated in life. One was boat measurers. <laughs> he felt that they were coming and into the way he built boats. And the second thing that I think really upset, well, made Jimmy particularly nervous is when the boat first took to the water, how would it do? How would it perform? And he was always very disappointed with the 107 because he felt it could have done better. And of course, we know what he did then. He built the 108. And I think that we can look back and say, right, the 108 went okay and certainly an awful lot better than the 107. It's a fond memory that I've had. And just to finish off, we. We never got tea in a mug. He always took out the cup and saucer and he always referred to Vivian as Mrs. Main. Oh. A real gentleman. Mm. I don't know whether any, I'm sure we've, we've all got our own memories of Jimmy. <laughs> that just kicks it off. But the interesting thing is that he never had a training in boat building per se. What he always said was that he picked it up from having to fix boats that needed fixing. And, you know, mm. because he was never a man who had an awful lot of cash. So the, it, he came from a generation where if, if, if it needed fixing, you did it yourself. And that's how he picked up the skill of boat building. His grandfather was the boat builder. His, father, right? his father was the farmer. Yeah. Ah. But of course, it was Paddy who did the garden. And, <laughs> and we all remember Paddy. And the two of them were like, well, they were brothers, of course. But uh, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy, did, Jimmy did the boat building and Paddy, who's in the Navy, he <laughs> was in the garden. What, what age was Jimmy? 94. 94, good innings, yeah. Yeah, you know I, mean? yeah, uh, I was absolutely privileged to meet Jimmy. On one occasion, I had some relations of Yodis's over from Switzerland and we went and called 
and we persuaded him to produce his models. And he produced the model of the Shannon One design, which is now in the museum in Greenwich, fortunately. And he had another wonderful model of an Iron Age boat and another one of a yacht. But his model making skills were absolutely superb. Uh, and then the window was open and the robin came in and sat on the table and was eating little bits of cheese. And Jimmy was very close to nature, very intelligent man, but highly skilled. And he had an enormous pair of hands. And my uh, nephew or niece commented on this afterwards that he could do very precise work, even though his hands were very large. But he was highly skilled and very, very intelligent man. I was a great privilege to know. Uh, Reggie. Yes, he he was uh, he, he he was very good at um, he his 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 uh, he he said to me that that his uh, that it took him much longer to 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 build a a, a model of a Shannon one design to build a Shannon one design itself. <laughs> you know, he maybe take three years to build a build a. Build a, build, build a model. And when he went, when, when, when I had the 78, and we had a not very good regatta in Lockdown, and I was commiserating with him, and, and, he, and he, he offered me to sail the 108 in, in, in Loch Wee. So I left, the and I left the 78 behind me, and took my sail, and went up to Loch Wee, and, and myself and himself and, and, and Bernard Darcy. Won the regatta without a, without any without without any trouble at all. So that's when I asked him to build me 112 because he was very worried at the time that there were that none of his boats were were, were doing any good. So he was delighted to do that then. But, but Peter, I think for that story you must take very little credit because oh. Jimmy, Jimmy really was an excellent sheet hand. Oh, he was, yeah, completely self taught. <laughs> <laughs> and he just carried you around, around the race. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Quite right. I think we could forget as, as well that, that Jimmy was an extremely good oarsman. He used to go up to, used to go up to Lanesborough. He would never talk about it, but he would win the races in Lanesborough and just row back. Mm. God. You know, on, of course, we, we know about the, the legends about the Black Islanders and what they did. They would row up to Carrick on Shannon, win the races and row straight back again. He <coughs> really was an extremely powerful uh, oarsman as well. The Blacks because it was faster. But they were it's incredible. I wrote, a letter, I, wrote, okay, I wrote a letter one time to Jimmy uh, because I wanted to ask him would he come up and sail with me in Loch Raymer Regatta. Uh, Jimmy would go and camp anywhere. He'd go and camp in Loch Derg and then he'd go off the Ura Point and swim in the morning. But anyway, uh, so I wrote him this long uh, letter putting in all the points as to why he should come and sail. I got back a letter that. Um, was four words long. Mount, Plunk <laughs> Mount Plunkett, which was his address. Yes, which was the answer. And Jimmy, which was the answer. That was it. <laughs> uh, I can remember visiting uh, Jimmy, and he always said, you're very welcome to Mount Juliet. Uh, <laughs> Where was Mount Juliet? Was that a, a house on the hill somewhere? No, no Mount, Mount Plunkett was, his own Mount, house was on the Mount Plunkett estate. Oh, sorry. Mount, Mount, Plunkett. Mount Plunkett are still visible, the, the foundations are across the narrow road from his house and down a little bit. Well, I remember asking him once, had he been to Dublin and he looked at me in horror and said, <laughs> Dublin? No, never. And I said, but how do you get all the stuff you need? You know, he said, I go to Limerick. He said, I go twice a year to Limerick. <laughs> and that was about 1976 or whenever we went yeah. to under ticket. Did he row or did he go in the whole train? I didn't ask. <laughs> I, <went> by road. 
Alan, I, I, I think I think Mrs. Main did slightly better than you. We've got a letter here from Judy, oh. <laughs> which is a little bit longer than yours. So um, <laughs> um, he says, uh, I did not get your boat started yet. And this is when we asked him, would he build a, a little rowing boat for Vivian? Uh, I was over on the Corrib to see the boat and take measurements. She is 15 foot long, 42 and a half inches wide and 15 and a half inches deep amidships. The transom is 15 feet wide, 15 inches wide. I remember you saying you would like to be able to stow her on the barge. So if you would like any alterations in the design, I'd like you to drop me a note. Trusting you're all well. Best wishes, Jay Fury. <laughs> yeah, lovely, lovely. The last time I went to see him, um, sorry, maybe my microphone is off. No, I can hear you. No, it's on. Yeah, you're speaking the, last time I went, yeah, the last time I went to see him, uh, about three or four years ago, just after Johnny Swan had won the long distance race, and we, we were talking about it, I went with Cleo, and um, and he said, oh, I, I did that in 76. And I, I, I wasn't sure if I'd heard him properly. I said, in 1976 or when you were 76? <laughs> well, he said, when I was 76. Um, but we didn't do well. He said, uh, didn't do too well. And, and he said, um, and it was very topical at the time. He said, I, I was like Brian O'Driscoll. I went on for just that one year too long. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we have that encounter on videotape and we'll root it out somewhere. And Philip arrived in, in the middle of the story with a with chocolate cake. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. And of course, he made the Transom Trophy, which Philip and myself and Teddy Knight um, asked him to do, um, which, which now is, is uh, presented every year for what I hope for the whole line of different. Uh, different regattas, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you remember, Peter, he wouldn't take any money for it. I know exactly he wouldn't. Yeah, we offed him. Absolutely not, no. And, 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 and the transom and, and, and the rather and the, and, the, and the tiller as well. Brilliant. And they, it was lost for a year or two. I don't know what, what happened to it. And then, and then Donald Gleeson managed to well, get strong it now. You'll be pleased to know. The rules changed. Yeah. Yeah. He went to France. Yes. There's Andrew. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you, Andrew. Look, there it is. <laughs> oh, well done, well done. I just wanted to share something with you, and that is um, every Christmas Eve, uh, Jimmy would spend his Christmas Eve with us in the kitchen, egg, and uh, Mum would open the Christmas cake and uh, cups of tea all around. He didn't drink. Oh. I don't think he drank, did he? No. Drank no. any alcohol? Uh, so he's in the right house for that. <laughs> and um, he also came to, well, midnight mass was actually 10 o'clock mass, in fact. So, um, yeah, Christmas Eve was, he was just part of the household. And anybody else, every sort of stray people just ended up in our kitchen. It was, it was great fun, really. Um, and uh, he'd stay on. I, I, actually, I can't remember what he did with the dogs. I, I, I'm just wondering now, did he have them in the car? or Because I never remember seeing the dogs in the kitchen. Uh, maybe he left them at home, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll miss him a lot, and uh, and so will my uh, soul of the family. But I can see everybody is uh, he seems to have struck a chord with everyone. Mm -hmm. And did he always have a, a, a Volkswagen Beetle? Did he have did he drive any other car apart from that? No, uh, yes, he progressed beyond the Beetle, but the Beetle is still in Mount Plunkett. It's looking all oh, right. It's looking rather sorry, actually. There's not much left of it. <laughs> there wasn't a huge amount left at times when he drove it, but I think he went on. I'm not quite sure what his latest car was, but it, it was also a rather small car. Four mm. um, I, I know the time that they, um, there was the unfortunate robbery where um, Paddy got bet up. And um, the next year, you're talking about not having much cash, but the next day he went out and he bought a brand new car just to show the bastards that they didn't get all the money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, remember, do you remember him going into town in the Volkswagen Beetle for nuts for his squirrels? Did any of you know about that? 
He was driving to Athlone to buy um, peanuts for his squirrels. Wow. Oh. Hazelnuts, probably. Oh. Thank you, everyone. Any last stories or memories before we come to a close? Yeah, there was. He bought, I definitely bought two Shannons. He built two Shannons for me, Dad, and like over the years, repaired many of them. And I think I'll tell you all these when we see in the future about the stories that were so long and they're so funny but we have fond memories the whole family do of any time Jimmy was in Drummondier he'd always call into the house whether he was delivering a Shannon to someone else and like that he always called into us I always came in for a cup of tea in the chat I think he had a great bond with my father he did. The, the two of them really got on so well and like the story when I think dad sold the 130 and Jimmy built him the 136 while that was being built I think they went off and raced in the 50 and the person who bought the boat, I think they bet him and I don't think he was too impressed. <laughs> but, uh, we all had a good laugh over that one. But yeah, and there was another time, the third, and we, myself and dad brought it up to Jimmy and put the ribs in and put the nails in and we brought it back to Drum and Ear because it was a bit of a rush. It was for the 75th Shannon One Design anniversary. And of course, myself and my dad in the middle, while everybody was in the yacht club having a great party, we were actually finishing off the riveting in the yacht club car park. I think that went on until about 11 o'clock at night and then two sent in for a couple of pints after a load of banging when everybody was having their dinner. But that was a bit of fun. We made it out then for the, the race the next day where it started with the oldest boat around True Goose, then to the newest one. And we were one of the first ones through Goose that time. Yeah, but it's definitely fond memories of Jimmy. Thanks, Donald. Of course, it's all it's all it's all recorded in on on that that that, te that television program. Uh, all Hands. 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 Yeah. That's right. Yes, yeah. that that was the building of the one three six. Yes, it was. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And we could all we could all, all see your father bouncing that horse hand all the way across the <laughs> across the train. And, and you know, <laughs> on the back of the trailer. If you know, was the covers on the Shannon were actually old post bags stitched together. They're the orange and blue post bags. And that had them stitched together to do as a boat cover and the back of the red cartina that that had for a long time. Great. Um, I have said of it, it's more dad's story rather than mine. Um, but dad sailed with Jimmy for years in the 80s when he kind of was going out with mum before they got married and before Jimmy made us the before in 1990. First time dad hopped in the 108 with Jimmy. Jimmy was there sitting in the middle as he did and dad was kind of hopping in asking sort of, okay, move, move on down now. And Jimmy, in classic Jimmy style went, well, it's my boat and I'm the sheet hand. So if you want to sail with me, get <laughs> the stick yourself. So that was that, that was dad's introduction to sods. And uh, it's great. <laughs> they did quite well together as a team. And uh, I think another one, I think it was sailing with Jimmy um, and I think mum, dad and Jimmy might have been sailing together. I probably got this wrong, but um, I think mum was actually pregnant at the time and fell overboard and Jimmy with his huge hands just grabbed mum out of the water, back in the boat. There you go. You're all right, love. Continue on sailing. I'd say dad didn't even notice. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it back to Philip a couple of years ago, possibly a little over 10 years ago, when I don't know what had happened to his crew for the afternoon, but the wind had got up and Philip came to me, tapped me on the shoulder. I need you. I need a bit of a crew, please. I said, that's fine, Philip. Absolutely. No problem at all. Who, have you, who else have you got? Jimmy, he says. Then he turned around to me and he says, you have the future of the sod class in the boat. Don't bloody catch eyes. <laughs> I'm wondering what uh, make of all of this, seeing as uh, I think the only piece of 20th or 21st century technology in the cottage was a mobile phone and maybe a nice stove towards the end. But uh, yeah. the, last, the last memory I have of him was immediately after a a rel relatively shortened North Shannon regatta, thanks to far too much wind, a bit like today. And I had, it was the only time I ever sailed the 108 in the hands of the new owner, uh, Georgina Corbett. 
and she had just helmed it for the first time and won all but one race. I think she came second. Anyway, we showed up to, uh, to the cottage at Mount Plunkett and shared this with Jimmy. He was absolutely delighted to see that it, it was in safe and highly capable hands. And we thought we'd probably be there for about 20 minutes and run out of conversation. About three hours later, we had to, uh, we had to eventually <laughs> leave as it was getting dark and we needed to make it back to Dublin. But I remember thinking when we, when we left him, this man could hold a conversation with anyone from any generation. And just to, to reflect on, on Justine's comment, he may never have made it to Dublin, perhaps he did once, but he was incredibly worldly wise and he really could hit you with any topic um, and, and keep a conversation going. He was a spectacular man to, to just sit and I'll always, always have fond memories of him. Just one other Kathy McAlevey had a great, great story about um, when, she, when she went down to, to help him build her, her Shannon. And she went, she took her, her mobile, mobile home down there and uh, lived in that while she was sort of helping with it. And, and some, uh, some farmer or another came up to me, oh, you're the one, you're the boss, are you? <laughs> there, was, there was a great thing, thing going around, oh, Jimmy has a mop down, living down and down, down there. <laughs> There's always great stories in the pub in there, in, in Coffee's pub. Um, about Jimmy and uh, the woman, and um, and of course it goes back to J.B. Keane and the land and everything. But anyway, mm, fine farm. Yeah. Anyway. Very good. But the important thing was that Kathy's dogs always got on very well with Cato, and that was the important part of the whole relationship. Yes, I bet. <laughs> Well, she's adopted Cato now. I mean, that that she's um, now got four. I think five dogs, including Jimmy's. Four. Four, including Jimmy's. Yeah. She lost one recently. Oh. Yeah. So, um, a couple of days before Dad passed away, Jimmy came to visit, and he stood at the top of the hill for, I'd say, a half an hour. So we were all inside, and someone said, "I think James has spotted him." I said, I think Jimmy Fury's at the top of the hill. And we were all saying, okay, why isn't he coming down? And it took him at least a half an hour to come down into the house, said very little, went down to visit dad, you know, nodded and left. It was lovely, very nice. When, when, just, when Reggie was talking about Jimmy's model making, and they were fabulous models, but um, some people may not realize he, and he didn't travel, so he um, entered, he was encouraged to enter his boat in the Duke of Edinburgh's awards, model making awards in London. Um, I think it was the Shannon, but anyway. Um, so he got his brother Paddy to bring it over because Jimmy wasn't going to go to London and he wasn't going to send it by courier or something. So, um, so Paddy went over anyway. But Jimmy uh, won the uh, gold medal in the Duke of Edinburgh's awards in London. Fantastic prize to get, and uh, just fantastic. So that's Jimmy. Great. Nice night. Thank you, everyone. Um, if there's, I don't know if there's any last comments or anything to make, that was uh, very good. No. Okay. Could you, could you just tell Hustle? Thank you, early this week, all week. <laughs> oh, I, I should be there. I, I, have to get, I, I should have to get my hair cut before then. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that the front of your head you're talking out or the back of it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking out of the hole in my head. <laughs> On that note, we look forward to our final, um, our final speaker next week, uh, which will be great. Uh, usual time, Saturday from five o'clock. Uh, I'll send on an email reminder as, as well. So thank you very much, everybody.
Thanks, Vincent. Thank you, 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 Vincent.